which on March 24, uh, your dance choir and our orchestra uh, are going to be doing a performance of a very famous piece of music by Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, his Requiem. And I wanted to talk about this a little bit with you all. Uh, I know we have lots of choir members in here, so they, uh, uh, they might like to hear this too. Um, part of it is because um, this piece is incredibly famous. This piece is incredibly beautiful. This piece is incredibly accessible. Even if you've never heard this music before, you will probably like it. Um, this is a piece that the choir's gotten very, very excited about. They started work on this, uh, oh gosh, eight months ago, I think, is actually when we started. Because we had we, we started on it, and then we took a break for Christmas. Uh, and now we're pulling it back out again, kind of scooping the cobwebs off to get it, to get it ready for us to do in March. But we're doing it. The reason we picked March 24 is because that's on Sunday. Um, and we're going to do it in the evening after after worship that night, which I think will be a nice uh, way to kind of kick things off for Holy Week. Um, it may be that you're thinking, oh, Mozart Requiem, that's way above my head. That doesn't really interest me. Or, oh, I heard that's in Latin. I really don't, I'm not interested in that. So I wanted to talk about it a little bit, kind of demystify the piece with you, um, hopefully get you a little bit excited about it. Um, and I'm going to get a little academic with you today, and I hope that, that doesn't, doesn't bore you to tears. Um, but it is a fascinating story about how this piece came to be. How many of you have seen the movie Amadeus? It came out like 1984. So good news and bad news about that movie. Uh, the bad news is that the storyline is completely false. Uh, there's no truth. No truth at all. Uh, there was a composer named Antonio Salieri. Uh, he and Mozart were colleagues. They were not necessarily friends. Um, but the movie puts forth this wonderful story about Salieri having it out for Mozart because Mozart was so brilliant. Salieri was very jealous. And so because of that, he put Mozart in positions to discredit him and ultimately have him killed. And the Requiem was sort of his tool by doing that, by killing him through overwork. None of that is true. It's a lovely story. However, what I'm going to share with you today is the real story of the Mozart Requiem. And I'm going to put it to you that it's no less interesting. It's actually very, very fascinating. There is a conspiracy. Uh, with the Mozart Requiem. There's a lot of mystery about this piece that took many, many years before it became unraveled. And I think understanding a little bit about how this piece came to be will explain part of why this piece is so famous, why this piece is performed so often, why people like me have such a deep love for this piece. So let's talk about a couple things here first. I'm going to see if I get everything right here. We good? Everything good? Great. Um, the first thing is that Mozart was hired to write a Requiem Mass in 1791 which is the year that he died. Mozart died very young, he died at 35, and he died completely penniless. He had no money. Even though he's incredibly famous now, the truth is that he had fallen, his music had kind of fallen out of fashion in Vienna. Um, he had a very lavish lifestyle. He wasn't very good with his money. Uh, and so unfortunately, by the time that he died, um, he did not have any money. So in 1791, he is maybe not destitute, but pretty close. And he is approached by a nobleman, named Count Waldseck, who lives about 100 miles outside of Vienna. His wife, Anna, had recently passed it, so he goes to Mozart and he says, Mozart, I would like for you to write a funeral mass, a requiem mass, in music, um, to honor my wife. I'll pay you half up front, and then I'll pay you the rest upon the completion of the piece. And it was a sizable sum. Mozart enthusiastically agreed. In truth, he probably didn't have the time to work on it. He was working on another very famous piece you may know called The Magic Flute. He was composing that to be performed in the common courts. He wasn't making a lot of money for it, um, but it was a passion project of his. He was in the middle of writing it, so he probably didn't really have the time to do it. But the money was just, was just more than he could pass up, and he felt like he really needed to say yes to this. But what Mozart didn't know is that uh, Count Waldseck was a thief. Waldseck was a musician in his own right, not very good. And what he liked to do was he liked to hire composers who lived far away to write pieces of music, and then he would recopy that music in his own handwriting and put his own name up in the corner and take credit as the composer for things he didn't actually write. And that was what Count Baltzek planned to do with the Requiem. I will take this piece from Mozart, I'll rewrite it, no, no copy machine in the 1790s, so I got to do it all by hand, but I'll rewrite the piece, I'll rewrite all the parts, I'll put my name on it, and then it becomes my Requiem. In 2023, that would be very difficult to do because of all the means of communication that we have. But in 1791, 100 miles is like Earth to Venus. I mean, it's just such a long, long way away that you can get away with stuff like that. And so that was Waltzek's plan, unbeknownst to Mozart. That was where everything was going to go. There's a problem, however, with the plan, which is that poor Mozart passed away. Mozart didn't start working on the piece until September. 
but he was already bedridden by the time November rolled around, and then he passed away uh, on um, uh, December 5, I think. Oh, I advanced the wrong one, hold on. There we go, I knew that was gonna happen. December 5, he uh, passed away, and the Requiem was unfinished. So now we've got a couple problems. Balzac doesn't have his piece, which he was hoping to uh, uh, copy into his own name. But Constanza, his wife, has an even bigger problem. This is Constanza. Constanza lived all the way until 1848. So she lived a whole 50 years after Mozart passed away. Long life for Constanza. She's a widow. She has two children. And her financial future is very much in doubt. She knows that Mozart has half a commission waiting for him if he were to complete the Requiem, but now he's passed away. And so Constanza hatches a plan, a very smart plan, a very shrewd plan. She's gonna go around to Mozart's friends, allies, students, and is gonna try and find someone to finish the Requiem anonymously so that Constanza can give the piece to Balzac and collect on the other half of the commission. Follow me so far? That's the plan. And it's a good plan, but there's a problem with that plan, which is that it involves, first of all, somebody doing this piece, finishing the work for no credit, finishing the work for no money, and here's the real kicker, you gotta make it sound like Mozart. Now that's hard. Because even in Mozart's lifetime, everybody knew Mozart was a genius. Everybody knew that Mozart's work was a step above everybody else's. Mozart's genius was so incredible that he could compose entire pieces in his head before he ever put pen to paper. It would be like writing a novel in your head before you ever start typing, you know? And, and you know, it wasn't, it, it was an amazing gift that this man had. And so many of these friends that Constanza would approach would say, look, I would love to help you out here, but you are asking the impossible. You are asking me to write convincingly like this genius. I can't do that. So the question is, because somebody did it, who finished Mozart's record? And how much do they write? How much of it is Mozart's? And how much of it is somebody else? So hold on to that thought for just a second. And let's talk about this piece. So a Requiem Mass, you may know, is a funeral service in the Catholic tradition. At the time that Mozart was alive, people didn't really write Requiem Masses to music. People wrote other Masses to music quite commonly, and Mozart did. He has a lot of Mass settings uh, from when he lived in Salzburg in the 1770s. But writing a funeral mass was actually kind of unusual. They existed, but it wasn't really something that a lot of composers were doing. So the request was unorthodox in the first place. It was unorthodox. The Requiem Mass is all in Latin, and it contains some texts that are very familiar and some texts that are very, very unique. Um, but then the other thing that's really interesting about this is that, that there's a lot of flexibility with the, with the Requiem liturgy. So it is permissible from a liturgical standpoint to take some parts of the Requiem and not others. So there's a lot of creative freedom that a composer can use because they can sort of draw on the text that really inspire them, um, and then they can leave some others out. They can't change anything, but they can pick and choose the things that they'd like to do. Now, I made a list here of some other composers because after Mozart's time, the popularity of setting Requiem masses to music became very, very popular and very in vogue. And in fact, a lot of composers really wanted to try their hand at writing a requiem as sort of a rite of passage, as a way of saying, you know, uh, uh, I'm, I'm a great composer, I'm a master composer, and now I'm going to try my hand at this famous, incredibly meaningful liturgy. Brahms, Verdi, Berlioz, Dvorak, Fauré, Durafle, Britton, Stravinsky, Penderecki, Saint Saëns, uh, uh, Bruckner, Cherubini, on and on and on. And then we have a lot of modern composers, people we sing in church all the time. Dan Forrest wrote a requiem. We sang it two years ago. John Rutter wrote a requiem. Andrew Lloyd Webber, the fan of the opera guy, he wrote a requiem. Lots of composers have set this text to music. But Mozart was among the first. And Mozart's is definitely the first of those pieces that we consider to be a masterpiece. All right. Now, in order to really kind of understand why this piece is so significant, it helps to put it in context. This is the 1790s. We are kind of uh, uh, in between the American Revolution and the French Revolution. We have a period of time with a lot of uh, enlightenment ideals that are kind of bubbling up. And there's an emphasis in a lot of um, secularism uh, that's really kind of bubbling up in our church music. 
So for example, if you went to a Catholic mass in 1791, the music that you would hear here would ostensibly be opera. Opera was the prevailing influence on all the music that was done in the church in this time. Italian music, bel canto singing, lots of solo passages. That would have influenced things. In fact, Mozart sometimes would take the music that he wrote for like Marriage of Figaro, and then he would put, you know, Sanctus, Sanctus, Sanctus over the top of it, and then he'd present it in church. He would just take a lot of his secular music and repurpose it. But not in the Requiem. The Requiem is very different. Mozart's style here is not secular or operatic at all. What it sounds like is something that's older, something that's just a little bit more traditional, specifically Handel's Messiah. Familiar with Handel's Messiah, Hallelujah Chorus? Yes. Um, Mozart, uh, about 10 years before he died, was hired to write a new orchestration for Handel's Messiah that would include more instruments. The actual orchestration for the Messiah is very, very small. Um, and somebody said, boy, wouldn't it be nice if we had trombones? Wouldn't it be nice if we had flutes? Wouldn't it be nice if we had clarinets? So Mozart was hired to reorchestrate the piece so that more instruments could play. He fell in love with the music of Handel through that process. And the music that he writes in the Requiem sounds an awful lot like that. Rather than sounding like the more secular music that was happening at the time, it sounds like something that's much more grounded in what Handel was writing in his oratorios. Very, very sacred. In most sacred music, the soloists are the stars. But when you come on March 24th, hint, hint, because I hope you come, uh, when you come, you'll find that we do have soloists, but they don't sing as much as you might expect. And when they do sing, they largely sing together as a quartet. It's almost as if Mozart's going out of his way to make sure that no singular person steps forward as being the star, but that everybody is sort of working together. Instead of highlighting individuals, the way that the piece is constructed is that we're all working together as a team. The choral writing is actually, in a lot of that secular music, is not terribly interesting. But what's very important to people who are really study this stuff is that Mozart wrote all of the choral music first. It is the anchor. It is the keystone that everything else is built upon. And while in the sort of secular world, orchestras were getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, the orchestra for the Mozart Requiem is actually quite small. One of the reasons why I picked it, very practical reason, is because uh, if you have a big orchestra, where are you going to put all those players on our wonderful, on our wonderful chancel? So this fits very, 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 very nicely up in that space. All right. All right. So who finished this piece? Well, I wish I could tell you that there was one person. There wasn't one. There wasn't two. There wasn't three. There were four people who contributed to the finishing of this piece in secret. The story starts with a uh, music publishing company called Breitkopf and Hertel who wanted to publish Mozart's work. And they got a letter from a man with the last name of Susmer who said, you need to know that I'm the one who finished Mozart's Requiem. This was very much a surprise to the publishing house. They didn't know anything about this. Constanza, for her part, had always insisted all the way through her life that Mozart wrote every note of that piece. She always said that. And now here's someone who stepped forward saying, no, 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 that piece was incomplete, and I'm the one who finished it. So one thing leads to another and leads to another, and eventually, Breitkopf and Herzl pulls together a bunch of people in the know, and they have a secret meeting. It involves Constanza, Mozart's widow. It involves a, a family friend by the name of Maximilian Stettler. And it involves the lawyer of Count Baltzek. Remember that guy way back uh, who's trying to steal the music to begin with? Stettler takes out a pencil and he takes Mozart's original manuscript in his own handwriting and he starts making notes. And he goes through and he identifies, these are the things that Mozart wrote. And these are the things that other people wrote. Other people meaning that there's four total people who contributed in some way. Oops, is it going? And there we go. The first one is a guy by the name of Freistetler. Now this is a student of Mozart's. And after Mozart died, they wanted to perform a little bit of the music at the funeral, which, by the way, is genius. Not only because the music is wonderful, but what a perfect way to make sure that nobody steals your music. Let's get it performed. So before Baltzek ever had a chance to copy any music, the music had already been performed at Mozart's own funeral, solidifying the fact that it was his piece. Very, very intelligent move uh, from that standpoint. Um, Frisch Detler completed the orchestration of the first movement so that it could be performed, and that's all he did. And I should say, when I say the orchestration, 
What I mean is, you know, when, typically when a composer is writing a piece of music, they'll start not with looking at a big page full of instruments. Usually they'll start with just like a piano score, like a treble clef and a bass clef. And they'll write melody and they'll write harmony. They may write text. They'll do that kind of thing. And most of the time they'll write the whole piece of music. And then in the late stages of the process, they'll do what's called the orchestration. Okay, what is the flute gonna play? All right, what's the violin gonna play? What's the cello gonna play? What's the trombone gonna play? What's the timpani gonna play? But that is a very late stage process. Does that make sense? It's like in the editing stage almost. Most of the time the composer will have already constructed the whole piece, not in this case, but most of the time, before they start doing the orchestrating. So what Frey Stadler is basically doing is sort of like editing. He's sort of taking that last step of figuring out what instruments are gonna play what. He completes that and then he tells Constanza, that's as much as I wanna do, this is too hard, I don't want anything to do with this. And so he walks away. The second person is a person by the name of Joseph Abler. Abler then is the person who starts doing the rest of the orchestration. But then he gets to a point where he has to start writing some new music because there's, there's stuff missing here. There's stuff that doesn't exist. He starts writing new music and he writes precisely two measures of music. And then he gets frustrated. And he goes back to Constanza in a huff, hands the score back to her true story and says, I'm done. I can't do this. It's too hard. I feel the weight and the pressure of this project and I can't do any more of that. Two measures, that's all he wrote. And then that was it. I'm gonna show you those two measures here in a second. Uh, and then Shetler, who we just talked about before, served as a copyist. So his handwriting is all over the score. So that means we've got four, five, really, to count Mozart, different sets of handwriting <coughs> on this music, in this score. And handwriting experts have looked at this before to really kind of confirm. But what Shetler said in terms of, well, Mozart wrote this, and this person wrote this, and this person wrote this, has turned out to be factually accurate. So this, you can see that, is the first page of Mozart's record. This is his handwriting. This is the actual thing. This is what Mozart was working on. Look at all that chicken scratch. Can you imagine trying to read that? I tell you, God bless computers. I don't know how we would have done it. Um, it's a lot uh, to kind of take in here, but you can see very faintly the word requiem in, uh, at the top. Mozart's autograph is a little smudged along with the date 1791 in the top upper right-hand corner. Upper left-hand corner, you'll see the word adagio. That's the speed, that's the tempo that we're starting, adagio being very slow. And then we have lines of music here. The first three lines at the top there are for the strings. That's violin one reads the top line, violin two is the second line, and then viola is the third line. Underneath that is something called a basset horn. Nobody plays basset horn anymore, not really. Uh, it's an instrument that was very popular. It has, it's very much like a bass clarinet. It has a low, uh, kind of hollow sound, which Mozart liked because he felt like that was very fitting for the text that they were going to be setting. Today, that part is almost always played by clarinet, which is what we're going to be doing for our performance. But basset horn is the original instrument. Underneath that is bassoon, two bassoons. Underneath that is the trumpets. They don't play anything yet. And underneath that is the timpani. Trumpets didn't play very much in this time period because this predates valves. So if you are familiar with a bugle, if you know how a bugle operates or a natural trumpet, there's only certain notes that you are able to play. So the trumpet doesn't end up playing all that often in the music of this time period because they're limited to the number of notes that they can play. But in 50 years after this piece, someone will invent the valve system that's on trumpets that allows them to play all of these. All of the notes. Then the next four lines are soprano, alto, tenor, bass. And the bottom line is what is called the continuo. That's basically everything I haven't mentioned yet. Bass instruments. Cello, bass, organ. Some people do this with harpsichord. We're not going to do that. But they all read the bottom line. And that's how everything breaks down. This is the first page of what's called the recordare. And it might be very hard to see. You're kind of far away. But in very faint writing up there, in two different places, you can see where Stettler wrote in pencil after Mozart died, what parts he wrote. See those? That first circle right there says Mozart. And that one up there also says M-O-Z right there. That's Stettler identifying that those are the parts of the music that Mozart himself wrote. He also took a pencil and circled the things that Mozart did not write. And in this case, 
It's that little line right there. Those top three string parts, there's a faint pencil mark that goes all the way around there. And that's Stettler identifying that Mozart did not write it. And I think, I, I don't, I'm not a handwriting expert, but I think that you can tell that the style of the notes, especially the eighth notes, are just a little bit different between the first three measures there and the rest of the music. This is the Lacrimosa, probably the most famous movement. But this is the last thing that Mozart wrote. It's not the last thing in the piece, but it's the last thing that Mozart wrote. And he only got eight measures into it before he passed away. He started writing some of the string parts. He wrote some of the choral parts. He wrote the continuo line. Oh, I already said that. Continuo line. This is the second page. Mozart wrote these three measures here, and then he passed away. These two measures up here were written by Joseph Abler. Remember I told you that he got so frustrated that he quit? He wrote two measures. That's it. That's as far as he got. He got that far, and that was it. So you can see there's a little, uh, there's a little line here. Everything on, everything on this side is by Mozart. And then Abler wrote those two nice little measures, and then he quit. He was completely done. The frustration was just too much work. So we've talked about three people, and now here's the fourth. The man that started it all, the man who wrote the letter, was a man by the name of Zeusmer. He was a former student of Mozart, and very specifically, he was with Mozart in the final days before he died. And so not only was Zeusmer uh, able to complete the Requiem, but what we assume would have been conversations between Mozart and Zeusmer before Mozart died. Zeusmer probably had a better understanding of what it was that Mozart wanted when the piece was completed than just about anybody, because he was there. He was spending time with him in those final years. Zeusmer was not publicly credited until 1827. He died in 1803. So by the time he passed away, no one, he never got any credit for the work that he did. The first time anybody gave him credit was 1827. And it wasn't Constanza. Constanza, until her deathbed in 1848, <laughs> insisted that Mozart wrote every single note. Today, we think very highly of Zeusmer for his ability to complete the work that Mozart started, to be able to finish a lot of the ideas that Mozart had created, um, and the love and respect that he had for Constanza, that he was willing to do that completely free and completely anonymously. This is probably more than you want to know, but this is a little chart here with all of the movements and who did what and how all of that music broke down. There are a total of five. There's Mozart, Freud Stadler, Stettler, Abler, and Zeusmer, all of whom contributed to finishing up this piece. It's pretty amazing. The first performance of part of the Requiem was at Mozart's funeral. Zeusmer completed the Requiem in February of the following year. Waltzek didn't receive a copy of it until 1792. But that didn't stop Constanza from then going ahead and selling a copy of the music to other people. So she sold it to Friedrich Wilhelm II of Prussia and apparently to the Elector of Saxony because he ended up with a copy of the score. So now we've got three copies of the score that are going out, which is very wise. The first full performance of the piece didn't happen until 1793, a benefit concert for Mozart's family. And poor Waltzek, he wasn't able to get his piece performed until December of 1793, because believe it or not, it takes a long time to handwrite all of those parts. It took him over two years to get it done. They do exist, by the way. You will find copies of the Mozart Requiem that say Waltzek in the upper right-hand corner, but nobody is fooled. Unfortunately, it took him too long to get it done, and by that time, the piece was already quite famous, uh, and he wasn't able to, uh, he wasn't able to uh, claim it to be himself. So why are we doing this? Well, the first thing is it's beautiful. <laughs> this is widely considered to be one of the greatest choral compositions in history. When I pitched this to the choir, uh, it, the response from the choir was enthusiastic. People had sung it before, wanted to sing it again. Some people had never sung it before, always wanted to. We had some people who hadn't been singing with us for a while. Dan, I hear you doing the Mozart Requiem. I would love to sing that. It's fun. It's beautiful. It's enjoyable to sing. Um, Mozart is the kind of composer who makes things very easy for the musician because the writing is so good um, that there really aren't a lot of moments where you're like, oh, this is uncomfortable for my voice or, oh, this is really difficult to sing or, oh, these phrases are just too long. Mozart is such a skilled composer, such a skilled craftsman, shall we say, that the music is, it, it, for as complicated and as beautiful as it is, it's actually quite lovely to sing um, and feels good. 
And um, I think uh, not only is it a joy to listen to, but it's a joy to perform as well. So that's part of the reason why we're doing it. It's beautiful. Mozart Requiem is very spiritual. Mozart wrote this piece specifically for liturgical use. It was supposed to be in church. It was supposed to be for a church service. And all the artistic decisions that he made about this reflect that. He didn't want to put emphasis on the individual. He didn't want certain individuals to shine above the others. He really put an emphasis on the text, making sure that all of the language can be understood, making sure that we are all kind of collectively saying this beautiful prayer. And that's what this is. This liturgy here is a prayer. It is a prayer of intercession to God on behalf of someone else. The word requiem means rest. Rest. Requiem eternam dona eis domine. Grant them eternal rest, O Lord. Et lux perpetua luce ad eis, and let perpetual light shine upon them. It's beautiful, and it's lovely. And it is a prayer not just for our own soul, but it is a prayer for someone else's soul, which I think is really, really lovely. Deeply spiritual piece. And then the last one is Mozart Requiem is accessible. If you've never heard this piece of music before, you will like it. You will like it. Uh, if you have heard this piece before, there's a good chance you're going to want to hear it again. It's the kind of piece that every time you listen to it, you find something different. You find something new that maybe you hadn't heard the first time that you heard it. Or maybe the first time you hear it, this movement really, really speaks to you. And then the next time you're like, wow, I didn't really notice this. But the second time I heard it, I really, really liked this. Now this is what is speaking to me. Every time you listen to this piece, it has something more to say to you. Which I think is really lovely. And I want to close with a, uh, a Bible verse. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a flash, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable and the mortal with immortality. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. <clears throat> Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ.